Hello, and welcome to the True Crime Lounge. My name is Breezy, and here we talk murder and crime. Any, any other forms of crime. This is the podcast to my YouTube channel. I also have a Patreon that you can go join. But you don't have to, but it will help a girl out. Um, I also have a merch shop that you can go look at as well. There are certain colors that pertain to a cause that will go to that specific charity and nonprofit. Um, but yes, if you're new here, also hit that like button, subscribe, um, com- comment something you want me to talk about, and ring that bell for notifications. You can also find me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Now that we got all that out of the way, let's see. Let's dive into our first episode and see how much I could talk about before I had to head to work, shall we? Now I'm going to go ahead and just close. This is a free pre-recorded episode. It is set to come out after a season after a season two finale episode um, of the TCL podcast. I am in college. I do work two jobs, so please be patient with me as I get the episodes out. You might recall my Killer Siblings episode where I discussed 10 cases. From that, I was going to discuss 4 and then a set that was not on that list. Well, um, if you have watched it, then you know this case, I did not discuss this case on that list. Be prepared, this is a bit of a long one, so we're going to see how much I can get in. Like I said, before I had to go to work. Okay, most of us probably know the case of the Menendez brothers. Am I right? Am I right? So, you probably know what I'm talking about. Well, this is probably one of the most well-known cases in the U.S. next to Elizabeth Smart, um, the BTK killer. Um, speaking of which, I have an amazing thing I want to tell y'all about the BTK killer that I'm saving for season for the season 3 um, premiere episode that you guys, I can't wait to tell you guys on. But anyway... Um, <laughs> this case is a Lifetime movie about it. It has several documentaries and podcasts that have covered the case. And this, and I just happen to be one of several podcasts who are also covering this case. And for those of you that do know, um, who the Menendez brothers are, do not know who the Menendez brothers are, they are sibling killers who killed their parents with a 12 gauge shotgun in their Beverly Hills, um, house. Um, it was sentenced to life in prison. Now, honestly, on a side note, I would totally buy that. I would buy that house, honestly. Because if you think about it, that house is probably real estate gold at this point. But, to, but that's just me personally. I would buy a house that someone has died in. Because, look at the real estate. Because illegally, there, is a, there are certain states that actually have to say, oh, someone died in this house. Anyway, let's get back to this video. Now. I want you to let me know in the comments, do you think the parents deserve to be killed? I have my own opinion of the case, but I really want to hear what you have to say. Um, but I will ask again at the end of the video, so it makes it a little bit easier and you don't feel like you have to answer right away. But, so we're going to start with Joseph Lau Menendez, and he was born January 10th, 1968, in Eric Galen Menendez. And he was born November 27, 1970, to Kitty and Jose Menendez. Both of the brothers who grew up in Princeton, New Jersey, were bo- with both attending Princeton Day School and Grade School, Lau would go on to attend Princeton. And the family moved to California in 1987. And this is when Jose got a job at... Carol Co. Lau was placed on academic probation at Princeton for his poor grades and disciplinary probation, and he would eventually drop out with allegations of plagiarism. Jose was born in 1944 to an upper-middle-class upper family in Havana, Cuba. His father was a well-known soccer player in, who owned most of his own accounting firm on his owned his own accounting firm. His mom was a swimmer who was elected to the Cuba Sports Hall at the time. He has two older sisters, um, T- 
Tessetta, who is known as Terry, and Malda, Malta, Marla. Although the family was not rich, Jose's parents did accomplish, had many accomplishments in sports, and this guaranteed him an honored place in Cuban society. Jose was five, <clears throat> was five years younger when Terry and uh, what, when Terry and was spoiled by their mother. During 1959 and 1960, Cuba was undergoing a revolution. Perhaps you might hear about this revolution for all our history nuts out there. I am one of those history nuts, so I can't really judge you on that. I don't, I seldom judge anyway. But anyway, this revolution happened to be the overthrow when Fidel, when Fidel Castro came into power and made radical changes in both the economy and the social welfare system of the country. His government seized the property of the upper and middle class, turned fam farms into collectives, and canceled all leases and marriages. The upper class and middle class last property was the lower class and the higher class prices. So, during 1960, Jose was 16, and after Castro came into power, his parents saw that their lives in Cuba would be forever changed. Um, so, the first step that made the the first step that they made was their decision to leave Cuba, and they came to the states. Jose flew into the United States with Terry's fiance and settled in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. Located between Squint, Scranton and Allentown, Jose survived pen, penniless, uh, arrived penniless and did not speak and understand English, but he was determined to succeed. And he, in his adopted country, he studied diligently in high school, worked part-time so he could earn spending money. Due to financial hardship, he was able to achieve one of his dreams in attend an Ivy League college. He promised himself that one day, when he had children, they would achieve this dream, his dream, and graduate from an Ivy League college. Jose was an athlete, got an athletic scholarship and a swimming scholarship to in Southern Illinois University. He did not like Southern Illinois and is remembered by his classmates. Um, uh, he is also remembered at, from his classmates to be withdrawn and, sell, and sullen. Jose supported himself financially with his athletic scholarship, but eventually walked away from his athletics to concentrate on his studies. There was one person that, who made Jose feel good, and here comes Kitty Anderson. So... Kitty, she was born in 1941. She was the youngest of four children uh, to Charles and May Anderson. Her family lived in Oak Lawn in the suburb north of Chicago, south of Chicago. And during her early childhood, her family was sol solidly middle class. And her father owned a heating and air conditioning business that did well. And her mother stayed home with, to care for Kitty and other two brothers. Milt and Brian and Kitty's older sister, Joan. Although the Anderson family appeared to be loving and close, Kitty's dad would beat her mom, sometimes in front of the children. Charles also would take this time to abuse his children as well. So before Kelly entered grammar school, her father left her uh, mother for another woman. In order to support the family, Kitty's mom worked at the United Airlines in Midway Airport outside of Chicago. Kitty's parents would eventually divorce, and this would cause a lifelong hurt of emotional scars for her. Throughout her childhood, she was withdrawn and depressed. She had difficulty forming friendships and did not really have many friends. 
in her grade or in high school in general. So, Kitty's father remarried and continued to live on Oak Lawn, and her family never married, remarried, her mom never remarried and became bitter and depressed by a divorce. Kitty grew up convinced that the divorce was the worst thing that could happen in a woman's life, and she hated her father and, during her parents' divorce. You know, as someone who has seen the ugly side of divorce, it's not pretty. And I think kids who witness it, they can actually see, like, it affects them differently, honestly. Um, I'm not going to go into all the baggage from that. From my, from my experience seeing the ugly part of divorce, but I will say it, it has affected me, like, especially when it comes to trusting people and, and relationships in general. But... In her senior year, she applied and was accepted to Southern Illinois University. In 1958, her freshman year of college, she began to work at the, in the university's broadcasting department, where she learned to produce dramas for the radio and television. And she gained a great deal of confidence throughout the participation of the um in these activities. During her senior year in 1962, she would become more confident. To compete in the Miss Oak Lawn Beauty Pageant, which was sponsored by VFW. So she, but she had always dreamed after she graduated from college that she would pursue a career in producing and directing commercial radio and television programs in New York City. Then, Kitty and Jose met during her senior year in Jose's freshman year. And in a short time, Kitty and Jose became inseparable. To Jose, Kitty was attractive not only physically, but and what she represented. Kitty was the daughter of a shopkeeper, the offspring of an American merchant class. By winning Kitty, Jose would est be establishing his claim to a new country. Jose fulfilled um, claiming that for Kitty as well. Claiming so something for Kitty too. Kitty felt there was there was a death to the loose that few people in hardships, not someone who was willing to slide by her family's connections or to work for money, like privileged classmates. Jose told Kitty his plan to make it in the big big in the business world. So, when Jose and Kitty were seen together around Southern Illinois campus, people would stop and stare. All of them, after all, it was the early 1960s, and they lived in a small, conservative Southern Illinois town. And there was many different ethnic backgrounds that did not mix in the in their civil rights movements in America or centered to the South. And yet, to, they were and yet to be reached to Carbondale. Kitty was three years older than Jose as well, so their age and background differences did not seem to matter to Kitty and Jose. They were determined to make their lives work together. Jose and Kitty's relationship caused a problem for both of the families. Kitty was surprised to see that she would choose a Cuban teenager for her future husband. And Jose's family thought Kitty was beneath their social standing because her parents were divorced. Jose's parents also thought that at age 19, Jose was way too young to be married. Um, Jose was also too young to be... And around this time, though, Kitty had graduated with her bachelor's in science degree in communication. And Jose and Kitty eloped and they secretly married in 1963. A lot happened in 1963. JFK's assassination. Um, apparently these two eloping happened. Civil rights movement was going on. Um, anyway, <laughs> after their marriage, um, Jose and Key moved into New York City. Jose's parents had fled to Cuba. Had fled Cuba. His mother in 1961 and his father a short time later. They had settled in New York City, and Jose gave up his athletic scholarship to Southern Illinois, transfer, transferred to Queens College, City University of New York, while Kitty found herself a job teaching 
Gray School, and during the early years of their marriage, Kitty, Kitty's dream of working in broadcasting began to fade and eventually discarded her plans to obtain a master's degree um, in order to support Jose in his career. So, what about their married life? Well, by 1967, Jose gra graduated from Queens College with a GPA CPA degree. He also went to work for Coopers and Library, an international accounting firm, and Kitty continued to teach grade school. In 1969, Jose was sent to Chicago to audit um, Lion Container, a client of Coopers and Library. Jose was impressed by the management in Lion's Container as they also came to him to work for the company's um, controller. Jose was 25, and Jose, Kitty, and their infant, their son, Joseph Lau, was born January 10, 1968, and they moved to Hinsdale, Illinois. Kitty became a full-time mom, while Jose worked hard to name and <clears throat> worked hard and turned Lion Container Life to a profitable company. So, by 1970, in 1970, Jose was named president of Lion Container. The, f the position did not last long because Jose and the chairman on the board became involved in a fight over the direction of the company. So, in 1971, Jose went on to work at Hertz, an executive in the car leasing division, and the Menendez family moved from Illinois to the East Coast and settled in New Jersey. Jose's second son, Eric, was born November 27, 1971. In 1973, Jose became Hertz's chief financial officer, and Jose rose through um, the ranks in 1971 when he was 35 and became Hertz's worldwide general. manager. So, Jose earned a reputation for abusing subordinates. His reputation would follow him for the remainder of his life. With, in 1980, his career ended at Hertz and another man brought up, brought in and made president, and Jose resigned, was reassigned to Entertainment Division, or RCA, to a company that owned Hertz. So, by 1981, Jose was assigned to, <clears throat> to RCA's rec record division and settled um, with overpaid aging recording stars. Jose then tried to turn the division around, signing up the Eurotronix and Justin Starship at RCA. His ethics came across as Un came under scrutiny, however. An example of Jose's questionable ethnics. Oh, my stomach. Oh. Guys, sometimes it sucks being a woman right now. <laughs> anyway. Um. With the practice of three months in the record, in the record stores, in order. to make sales appear larger than what they were. So, in 1986 alone, RCA was forced to honor 25 million in return albums. By 1985, at the age of 41, Jose had risen and become an executive vice president and chief operating officer for RCA Records statewide op operations. And, however, as hard as he tried, he was unable to turn RCA records around. So, from the beginning of their marriage, Kitty had already given Jose the freedom that he desired. <clears throat> as much, <clears throat> as much for as he promised heard that their marriage would be a partnership. In reality, Jose made decisions for both of them, but without consulting Kitty, often without consulting Kitty. During their life, Jose acquired a number of mistresses and mistresses. I have a speech impediment, so guys, so I am very sorry. Um, anyway, Jose's longest lasting affair began in 1978 with a woman named Louise, who was a dark-haired self-confident businesswoman. 
Louise and Jose would travel together and entertain a couple uh, in her home her in her pent townhouse in Manhattan. So, Jose cared deeply about Louise, yet he never gave any thought about leaving Kitty. He never considered ending his affair with Louise, and he felt good with Louise. She enjoyed his ego. She buoyed his ego, and yet boosted his ego. And yet, for some time, he was unaware of his um affairs. Jose was able to soothe Kitty with false yet convincing claims of his faithfulness, but she soon became suspicious over time. Well, in 1981, she uncovered one of his relationships and walked in, walked out of their home for several days. Jose managed to convince them to come home, more or more so for the brothers than because he loved her, and according to Jose, according to Jose's brother-in-law. So in 1980, at the time, at about the same time of Jose's career was coming to an end, at RCA was coming to an end. Kitty found out about Louise, and she told Jose told Kitty about Louise and his other affairs, and this sent Kitty into a depressive spiral, and talk, and she talked about committing suicide through contacts um that um. He had made while at RCA, he was able to find a position as president at Live Entertainment in California. Live was a video distribution and duplication company that was partially owned by um, Carol Co., a movie production company. He best known for businesses and he had no problem uprooting his family and moving them to the East Coast, from the East Coast to the West Coast, at the time. And Jose was brought up to the family to run live. It had posted to loot a loss of twenty million for nineteen eighty-five, and Jose saw another opportunity to turn a struggling company around. Kitty wasn't so positive about the move. She has spent a lot of time in the past sixteen years building. A life outside of her marriage, and she established a network of friends who cared about her, and who turned into turn and who cared about her. So Jose and Kitty had recently purchased a home in Princeton, New Jersey, that Kitty considered their dream home. Nevertheless, Jose <coughs> decided that it would be Kitty and Eric's best interest to move to California with them. They settled in Calabasas, an upper middle class suburb, in the northwestern part of San Fernando Valley. In their lives, and Lyle remained beyond in Princeton to attend college. So, Jose dedicated himself to raising. raising Great sons who will carry out plans for the future and continue his legacy because he had fought his way through the corporate ladder. He understood that there would be life would be easier um the more he refrained from ref, remain refrain <clears throat> the more he refined his way to reach the top and training his sons to reach their peak. So. When the brothers were young, Jose Jose had rules for everything, in which what they could eat, what they could spend, who they could spend time with, and what they could read and think about. Every time, uh, every hour in the day had been accounted for, and Jose and Kitty had did not take into um account that. They will be dealing with young children, nor did they I lost my place, guys. I am so sorry. Anyway, 
nor with the fact that their children will be flawed. Come on, we all have flaws, guys. But, anyway... Jose's greatest flaw was his viciousness and probably grew out of his insecurity about his ethnic seat. Jose re relished in humiliating Anglo, Anglo colleagues who made him, who made mistakes, yet at the same time, he sought acceptance from them through his efforts to transform himself into an American. He encouraged businessmen to call him Joe rather than Jose. So, the pressures of meeting Jose's fam demands appeared early in Lyle and Eric. Both parents, both brothers developed stutters, stomach pains, and had a habit of grinding their teeth. Both brothers also developed nasty tempers, and as they grew older, the brothers were drawn to each other for companionship and solidarity. In order to face their father's control, Eric grew up worshipping Lyle. Eric often told his family, his friends, that how much he admired his brother, um, his brothers. Eric probably couldn't understand why that they thought Lyle was seriously tr serious trouble. Um, his worship of his brother is probably come from the fact that Jose was was so remote with that his younger son did not feel he could approach him, um, whereas Lyle, he was more approachable, and Jose was um, more of an overwhelming presence. So, the brothers would find themselves and comment that they, they a lot of people would comment that they were extremely close, the brothers were extremely close. So, but their personalities were also very different. While Lyle was described as aloof and witty, Eric was more described as sensitive and quiet. So basically, Lyle was also described as having a stronger personality. So beginning when the brothers were about grade school, Jose posed a question about current events at the table. Occasionally, Eric was allowed to answer, but most of their questions fell on to Lyle to answer. As the brothers grew older, the questions became more complex. Jose described each other each brother as more um <laughs> Jose described each brother should select one sport to excel in. Jose encouraged the brothers to pick a sport that did not require them to to be members of a team. So he felt that teamwork challenged his authority and called the question by raising his sons. So by the time Lyle was 12 and Eric was 9, they had both selected tennis. So, in 1979, the family was living in Pennington outside of Princeton, New Jersey. Lyle had attended the Princeton Day School and a, a private school. And at Princeton Day School, both brothers were considered average students. Lyle had developed problems academically, and he was in the sixth grade. And his teachers said that found that he did not. He was not well prepared, and that he did not have the ability to concentrate. Teachers at Princeton, at the Princeton Day schools felt that both Lyle and Eric had some learning problems, but Jose would not accept that his son had flaws. Toxicity right there. Um, the brothers noticed that the homework um, the brothers turned it was in far was far better than the work completed in class. Teachers also noticed that the brothers were Im immature compared to their classmates. So at the age of 14, Lyle well, still wet his bed and played with his stuffed animals. There was other signs of Lyle and Eric that were headed for serious trouble. So in 1982, when the brothers were 12 and 15, their cousin Diane Van der Molen stayed with the Menendez family for the summer. One night, the three cousins began playfully wrestling, and suddenly, without warning, Lyle and Eric began to undress Diane. Without saying a word, the brothers tied her up, stripped her off her shirt, and she screamed, and the brothers retreated from the attack. The brothers also attacked her like a pack of dogs with no warning. As suddenly as the attack had began, it ended. Around the same time, Diane experienced another attack. 
This time, she and Lau were watching television, and without warning, Lau struck, and he climbed on top of her, and he began to fondle her breast. Like, he attacked earlier, and they had not, and she had not enticed Lau, or in the attack, ceased as soon as it was, as she was able to free herself. So, what y'all think so far? Do you think these that do you think these parents deserved it, or do you think these were two spoiled boys who just want had a hissy fit? Well, let's see. Well, Lau was the first first romance came when he was only fifteen, and his relationship with his girlfriend Stacy Feldman was innocent and chaste, as previous attacks on his cousin Diane had been perverse and sexual. Stacy managed the men's varsity tennis team at Princeton Day School, and Lau was the number one ranked player on the team. Their first date was to see the Raiders in the, of the Lost Ark, and Lau was a huge moving fan, and going to the movies was perhaps the only experience that Lau was able to and find himself enjoying, and it kind of like filtered through his parents. So Lau soon. Um, to have seemed to have grown up to completely believe in that that was true. He never seemed to be able to distinguish what was between fact, fact and fiction. Well, Stacy and Lau fell in love, and they walked into Princeton Day School hand in hand, with, which was against the rules. And the teachers and administrators left an infraction pass because let this pass because. They felt like that Stacy and Lau were awkward kids who needed each other. So, at the time, end of the school year, Lau and Stacy were voted most married, and by the time they reached their classmates, Lau and Stacy had began getting more married to their. Lau and Stacy talked about getting married and having more children. So, he lavished her with jewelry, basically another gift. Um, but she ended their relationship when they went off to college, realizing that she wanted to experience more life and that it was too she was too young to be married. Um, Lau was hurt by his her rejection and tried to win her back, promising to buy her a car at fur for a coat. She was not interested and he moved on. Jose dreamed that Lau would attend the Ivy League College, and Lau, who was not good, who was not a good student, told his family that he wanted to skip college and open a restaurant with his father's financial backing. Jose was not would not entertain thoughts in anything less than the Ivy League education. So when Lau initially applied to Princeton in 1986. He was rejected. He then enrolled in a local community college, submitted another application for Princeton in 1987. While Lau awaited to hear back from Princeton, he found he met and began dating Jamie Parsonick, a waitress at a local Princeton restaurant. Jamie was also a tennis player and five years older than Lau, and was Kitty and Jose's, and did not like Jamie because they felt she was dating Lau because he was part. Because he was rich. So, Lau, in 1987, Lau got accepted to Princeton and more, more on his strength in the ethnicity and ability to play tennis than his test scores. So, during the summer of 1987, Lau and Jamie announced they were engaged and this, of course, angered Jose. Um, Jose felt that Lau was too young to be married. Tell calling the kettle. What? <laughs> Interesting. Shortly before Lau began at Princeton, Jamie moved to Alabama to teach tennis, and Lau followed her. Jose was so upset that they secretly arranged to sponsor Jamie on a European tennis tour, and Jose thought that once Jamie was out of the picture, Lau could concentrate on Princeton without any distractions. He was wrong, and Jose followed Jamie to Europe. 
So, final mission in Princeton was contingent that he, on each of the freshmen signing a, a letter promising to obey the honor code. And the honor code has is placed at Princeton since 1893, and Lyle signed it probably thinking that any trouble he got into, he could get could be handled the way Jose's taught him. Lie, cheat, steal, but don't get caught. Sounded so country when I said that. My southern accent was coming out. So, during his first semester at Princeton, Lyle was accused of plagiarism. Specifically, Lyle was required to complete a laboratory assignment in his Psychology 101 class. In a freshman level course, where well, Lyle was accused of copying a lab, partner's homework assignment and turning into uh, his own own work. So when Lau realized that how much trouble he would be in, he asked Brandon Scott, a priest and a doctoral student, to assist him with his defense. And he told Brandon that he had missed a number of previous assignments in the class. Because of this, he could not afford to miss another. So during this time, he was traveling back and forth on his weekends to California to visit his family. During the weekends before psychology lab was due, he had traveled to California and lost his notebook with his notes at the airport. He even asked his lab partner if he could look at the assignment, and the assignment that he um, handed resembled Lau's lab partner so closely that the instructor singled it out and got the attention of campus authorities. Jose found out the plagiarism accusation from his sister Terry, in whom Lyle had confided. At first, Jose did not think that um, there would be any serious consequences for Lyle. Jose sent a statement to read at, for the Ethnics Disciplinary Committee. Lyle, as usual, when he was in trouble, he tried to cover it up to in Jose's protective cloak. But, Jose and Lyle underestimated the trouble that Lyle was in, and after a four-hour hearing, the disciplinary committee deliberated that Lyle was guilty of plagiarism and suspended him for one year. So, after learning the outcome, Jose flew immediately to Princeton for a meeting with the president. At that meeting, Jose argued punishment was unduly harsh and did not fit the crime. Jose argued that this was homework assignment had not had not a large part of Lyle's grade. The student was unmoved and inform, informed Lyle that he could return to Princeton in 1988 in good standing. 88 in good standing. So. Lyle had a meet had come to face the Princeton and failed his um heart to Princeton and failed his Princeton test and he hated school, rarely participated in campus activities, and he was devoted to winning and being the first to, being first that he had a difficult task. He was also had many suggestions of competing at an Ivy League college and he, he was humiliated when he wanted to transfer to UCLA or University of Pennsylvania, but Jose would not hear of it. So, during the year that Lyle was out of school, Jose made an attempt to, that he would keep busy, and Jose was concerned that he was, um, giving his sons too many advantages, creating rich, spoiled brats, and Jose put Lau to work at Live, and he was responsible for reviewing expense reports and looking for the ways to remove, improve efficiency and reduce costs. Lau was treated like any other employee, and he had to make an appointment to see Jose. Even though Lau's employment at Live was brief, it left a deep and lasting impression on him. He would somehow see the atmosphere in the office grew tense and that Jose was around and how berated the employees were for him. Lyle told his friends that he was res he resented it all alive because of his he was the boss's son. And the fact that Lyle was resented at life not because he was the boss's son, but because of his lack of worth ethnic. So Alright guys, 
I had to start getting ready for work here soon. Um, I will when I come back. I will try to finish up some more episode, some more part. This is gonna be a long one, like I said. Um, but I will try. This might have to be a two part episode, really and truly. Now I'm looking at it, but I will be up and having it as soon as as soon as possible. Thank y'all. All right, so. My always remembered for by those at live as showing up late and unapologetic for work. He also was remembered as for ignoring or orders and not paying attention. Also skipping a lot of work entirely on warm days to play tennis. Some even described him as nasty, arrogant, and self centered, and was some of his co workers described According to some of his co-workers. So, he finally... So, finally, one of Jose's associates went on to complain. And, what would be if Lau would not be the boss... Was not the boss's son? Hang on, we got a second, guys. So, Lau would finally return to Princeton... In the fall of 1988, and he will continue his relationship with Jamie Passerick. And when he did finally return, it was discovered that he was assigned a roommate. He wanted a single. And I bet which boy wasn't happy about that, right? Well, according to the Hall's t- student advisor, when Lau, was, when Lau saw his belongings of the other students in the room, he threw them in the hall. The student advisor said that I'll do what I want, when I want, attitude that Jose came to in Lau's defense. He also wrote a letter to Princeton requesting a single for Lau. Lau was outside, Lau was given a single and, like that previous year, did not participate in any campus activities. The only outside activity that Lau seemed to show any interest in was cultivating friendships with groups of students that were also jocks. So, in February 1989, Jamie introduced Lau to Donovan Goodrow. Donovan came into Princeton after spending two years at junior college from Northern California. He also always wanted to travel and make made his way across the country, winding up at Princeton because he was attracted to the school's reputation and a large number of people his own age. Donovan was trying to sort out his future plans, and these two quickly became friends. And Kenny and Jose were glad to see Donovan around because now that they were living in California, they could no longer compete, complete Lau's homework for him. Donovan was willing to wa- write his essays in the effort to keep him from failing. So during the, during the spring of 1989, he began to date a model named Christy. Well... Christy was dirty, and she, and the relationship upset both Jose and Kitty. That was another issue that upset Jose even more than Lyle, who continued to trans, continued to desire to transfer to UCLA. Cause, let's okay. Basically, he was tired of Princeton, but Jose, he really didn't want to entertain those from transferring to another school. It was his dream for his kids to go to, uh, pro, uh, elite. Ivy League, right? Well, so after Lau returned from spring break, Donovan had accused him of stealing from students in his dorm, and rather than defend Donovan, who mistreated, who insisted he was innocent, about the death, Lau confronted him to his friends, and Donovan was forced to leave Princeton in a haste to leave. And leave Lyle's dorm room. He also forgot to pack his wallet and con- contained his driver's license, security card, social security card, and other identification. So, who is Eric? Well, Eric grew up emulating his older brother, and for the for a time, he lived in the shadow of Lyle, especially in the Princeton Day School. It seemed that the brothers fit in at the school, and they were both considered to be mysterious loners, who laughed at their own private jokes, 
they did join in play with other children, and even their schoolwork like Wiles was average. So, throughout throughout his grades or his, uh, in high school, Kitty completed much of Eric's school homework for him, and Eric learned early in life for, to, that Jose was grooming loud to become a future leader of the family. He grew up sad and withdrawn. So, when Jose, Kitty, and Eric moved to California in 1986, Eric was a sophomore in high school, and he was enrolled at Calabasas High School. Um, his Away from his brother and the comparisons that were often made between them, the Princeton Day School, Eric found his own identity and made friends with a group of boys who were like him. Found with a rebellious streak, Kitty had also been worried that Eric's sexual orientation for some time. He believed that he was gay. He also, when they moved to Calabasas, he gave Eric an order to find a girlfriend in six months. Eric found an older girl at Calabasas High, but their relationship was short-lived. At a party, Eric and the girl argued. The girl argued, and Eric locked the girl in the bed. In the bed, left in the bed in a room. He would not. He would not get let her leave. She screamed and yelled, but Eric would not let her out. Finally, Eric let the girl go, and the girl had enough of Eric. Later, she recalled um, him that he was one of the oldest, oddest guys that she has ever met, and that he was very arrogant, very confident, but deep down, he had a lot of problems and insecurities. Okay. So, Eric later found another girlfriend, Janice, whom Kitty and Jose both liked. Unlike Lyle's girlfriends, whom Kitty found cheap, Kitty taught highly of Janice. Perhaps Eric's most important relationship at Calabasas High was with um, Craig Sigonarelli. And he was the captain of the tennis team, and Eric was the number one ranked player on the team. So Craig and Eric spent a lot of time together and wrote a third-rate screenplay entitled Friends. The script was a two-page thriller about a son from a wealthy family who reads his parents, Will, and learns that upon their death, he would inherit $157 million. The son's murders uh, everyone in an attempt to get the money before killing. Remember that fact. So, in July 1988, Lyle began breaking into houses in Calabasas and brothers bur burglarized homes and by par owned by parents of their friends and were surprised by the large amounts of cash and jewelry they were able to steal. The brothers found an easy source of spending money, while rather than having to ask Jose for a handout or listen, the Jose lectured him about hard work. So the amount of jewelry um, that Lau and Eric stole from was accumulated to be more of, more than a hundred grand, large enough to be classified as a felony offense called grand burglary death. Not Grand Theft Auto, even though I really want to say that's so bad. But anyway, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department Sheriff's Detective who investigated the burglaries received a break in that case after Eric was stopped for a driving violation in Calabasas and stolen property was found in his trunk. Later, the detective discovered that a safe of one of the homes that the brothers had burglarized was found in another home burglarized by the brothers. It appeared that the thieves had been developed a guilty conscience and returned to safe from that they had stolen from to their own home. Jose was furious about the burglaries and he did not want his son to spend any time in jail. So, in hired Gerald Gillespie, a well respected criminal defense attorney to represent him and Gillespie was able to work out an agreement with the Los Angeles County's DA's, the LADA's office that would resolve Lyle in any participation of the burglaries if Eric took responsibility of the crimes. Eric was a juvenile and had no previous record. 
So he was able to convince the judge to sentence Eric to community service with the homeless and for the brothers to undergo a psychological counseling. Jose wrote a check of $11,000 to the victims to cover them and that had been stolen by the brothers, but that had disappeared and could not be returned. The burglaries were, were the talk of Calabasas, and it seemed that the neighbors of the Menendez family were uncomfortable knowing that Lyle and Eric were free, and that he had blamed Princeton for Lyle's plagiarism rather than Lyle. Jose had a difficult time understanding that the brothers' behavior and why Lyle and Eric had victimized friends, people they supposedly valued. So, Jose began to complain about living in Cal Calabasas, and he told the people at lives that the family was receiving harassing telephone calls, and that his tires had been sl slashed. It may have been all the wrong way to receive, may have been the talk of the way Jose saving, saving his face. He told associates that he felt like he and his family would not be would be safe for living in Beverly Hills. So, th these were not only burglaries the police were able to pin out at the Menendez Brothers. In April 1988, two, two burglaries took place in the New Jersey office of the Sierra Club in the office of the Princeton Friends and of Open Spaces. In these burglaries, officers' equipment was stolen in the value of approximately $1,100 in offices were housed at the same property that the Menendez family owned just before their move to California, and the house in which Lyle had lived in before entering Princeton. Jose and Kitty had sold the house in November 1987, and the police were left with few crimes, few clues who committed these burglaries. In both the burglaries, the burglar had entered through the second bedroom floor bathroom. Yeah. So the police were finally able to connect Lau and the burglaries. After a confidential police informant came forward, the, the informant told the police that one day during the summer of 1988, he had been riding to the beach with the Menendez brothers, and Lau played a cassette tape and tape of the recording of the voices talking. There was background noise, and Lau bragged to the informant that he was listening to the tape recording of a burglary that Lau committed in. The old house in Princeton, Lau never ch ch charged, but he was never charged. But by the time the police were able to connect Lau to his crimes, he had already spent, he was already in jail and had more serious charges. So, what happened in summer of 1989? Hmm, there were some people born in 1989. But anyway, um,. Jose was doing well at life. His contract had recently been renegotiated and extended until December 1991. In recognition of Jose's importance of life, the company invested in a key man life insurance policy that would guarantee if Jose died, the company would continue operating without worrying about going under. The policy was valued at $15 million, $15 million and Live also purchased a key man um, personal policy for his family, which is valued at $5 million. Jose would be named a beneficiary as soon as he took another physical examination. It was expected that Jose named Key as the beneficiary, which was customary under California community property taxes. As the family returned to, as the spring turned into summer, Lau was facing several major problems. His girlfriend, Christy, told him that she was pregnant, and he found out when he found out he and went to see her, according to Lau, Jose intimidated her into having an abortion, and Kitty told one of his friends that Jose paid Christy a hundred grand. And after paying her off, Jose and Kitty demanded that Lau give her up for good. So, his spring semester report from Princeton was terrible. His grades were dismissal, including one F, 
and Lau was on academic probation despite Donovan's assistance with the papers and assignments. According to Carlos Barrett, Jose's father-in-law, Jose, tried to adjust um, his expectations to meet Lau's academic performance and tried to put too much pressure on Lau. He wanted to do something, wanted to press off his class. Academic probation was not only was not the only problem, however, he was facing at Princeton. Shortly after he came home, Jose and Key were notified that Princeton was repla- placing Lyle on that disciplinary probation. After some tables in the residence halls were damaged during the party and he had been thrown. He had tried to blame blame for this by um, he had been blamed for this and um, placed on disciplinary probation for, by his friends. For his fr- on his friends, this wasn't the end, though. However, in New Jer- his his New Jersey's driver's license was suspended, and this caused his family's privilege to, at their country home in Princeton to be suspended. He and Donovan took a nighttime golf club across the greens and caused a large amount of damage, because they had to pay restitution at the country club. Just let them take responsibility for their own action at this point. Jeez, Jose. Jose could have understand what went wrong with his sons. Could not understand what went wrong. Really, Jose. You couldn't understand what went wrong. <sighs> he was losing his patience and less and less willing to be persuaded by Lyle's rationalizations. Jose and Kenny were so desperate to drive them, drive home to see their so to their sons and how serious their circumstances were. He was the only thing that they thought would get them through was threatening them to rewrite their will and leave the brothers out completely. Jose's first will had been written in 1980 and before he was amassed with his wealth thus stated that if Jose and Kitty died on a common disaster, Lal and Eric will receive their entire estate. So, after graduating from Beverly Hills High School, Eric completed a number of tennis tournaments during the summer. He initially played well, and he won his first round matches. However, he lost the second round matches. In August, Eric returned to Beverly Hills and waited to begin college at UCLA. Eric had also been accepted to UC Berkeley, but chose to attend UCLA because it had a better tennis team. In order to encourage Lyle to exert more effort in school, Jose purchased a condominium outside Princeton for him. The condo had two bedroom suites and would be perfect when Kitty and Jose would come to visit. They could stay in the w- one of the bedrooms wa- without intruding on Lyle, and Lyle asked Kitty to decorate the condo for him. So, the summer came to an end with tensions. In the house in the escalator, Kitty began to lock the door to the bedroom, and she kept the twenty-two rifles in her closet. She was not; she would not allow Lau and Eric to have keys to the house. When the brothers came home that night, Kitty would let them into the house, even if it had been awakened from sleep. They had been awakened from sleep. If it it was apparent that something was frightening Kitty, her fears were probably excavated by something that the brother's psycho- psychotherapist Jerome Oriel told Kitty. So, on August 19, 1989, the family chartered a boat from the Marina del Rey and went fishing, according to the crew, and did not seem to have much tr- um, of a family. Jose stayed in the back of the boat and fished, while Kitty went below deck of the boat and claimed that she was seasick. The brothers stayed to themselves at the bow of the boat. The murders would go on to happen August 20th, 1989, in the dinner of the family house. Like I said earlier, I would personally love to go and buy that house. 
Mainly because I just love a house that someone died in. Especially like older houses and stuff like this, but just saying. But the chances are, if you buy an older house, there is somebody who has died in it. That's the bottom line. And a lot of states are legally required to um, just disclose that whenever you go to buy a house. That's real estate cool too right there, for crying out loud. Anyway, um, Jose and Kitty were tired from that summer ending because the family had been shark fishing on the shark yacht. They, so, until midnight the previous day. So, Lout and Eric went out that evening while Jose and Kitty were in the den watching a James Bond movie. The Spy Who Loved Me. So, around 10 p.m., the neighbors reported hearing that the, what sounds like firecrackers, however... They dismissed it as nothing concerned about, to be concerned about. You know, I would have figured, you know what, I live in a nice area like that. You know, I would probably call the police, right? But apparently if you live next to Menendez Brothers, you don't really think twice about it, right? So, Jose would be shot point blank in the back of his head with a Mossberg 12 gauge shotgun. The shots were shots woke Kitty. In the spring from the couch, and she made her way to the hallway. The shot hit her leg, which resulted in it breaking, and she then slipped in her own blood and fell. Well, she was shot several times in the arm, chest, and face, leaving her unrecognizable. Both of them were shot, and they made it appear to be mob-related. The brothers then drove off, dumped their shotguns in Mullahan Drive, and brought tickets at a local theater, seeing the movie licensed the movie License to Kill he used as an alibi. <laughs> really guys, really. Anyway Then at eleven forty seven when the brothers returned home, Wow called nine one one and cried, Somebody killed my parents. The police are immediately considered brothers suspects. But had no leaves. At their trial, Eric s said he spotted a shotgun shell and it was shot on the floor and recovered it from the police, took it as they took it away. Security at 722 North Elm Drive was at a high standard. The Mediterranean Mansion had been rented to look like the Prince of Elton John. To the likes of Elton John. Jose left the alarm system off and the gates open. And after the Mercedes Benz was stolen from the front of the driveway just weeks before the murders, Kitty, on the other hand, was agitated at the time leading up to the murders, constantly locking her bedroom and keeping the rifle in the wardrobe for safekeeping. It was clear that something was troubling her. She did not mention to her psychiatrist a few weeks before the murders that her sons might be so she did mention that her son might be sociopath. Gee, I wonder how that could have happened. No judgment. Trying to get bias out. But anyway, in the months after the murder, the brothers led a nice uh, life of luxury and lavish spendings. According to investigators, suspicions that they had been involved in their parents' death. He was thought to have expensive Rolex rocks. A uh, purchase Guerrero, a uh, Chuck Spring Street Cafe, a uh, Buffalo Wings um, restaurant in Princeton, and Eric was hired by a full-time staff to to complete a tour in a tournament in Israel. They left North Elm Mansion unoccupied and lived in two separate penthouses on Marina Del Rey. Then they would drive around L.A. in their late mom's Mercedes. Banks convertible and costly lunch and dinners. It is reported that they spent about one million in their first six months after the shootings. So on December 8, 1992, the Menendez brothers were indicted in the Los Angeles grand jury uh, for the murder of their parents. All right, that is it for part one. I will have part two out soon. Um, what do y'all think so far? Do you think these was just rich boys who got tired of mommy and daddy? Or what? I am curious. Let me know. Um, I'll see y'all next time.